I get two questions whenever I cover M1 Max on this channel. The first is how much RAM should I get between eight and 16 gig? I've answered that up here. And the other one is how much storage should I get? Today, I'll answer that question. Welcome back to Mark Ellis Reviews and thank you as always for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, just hit the button. So I don't think Apple make it particularly easy to buy their new M1 Max. You know, we're a few months into these machines now and people still don't know whether to get the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro or the Mini. And I totally understand why people are confused because the spec options are just a bit odd at times. Now I've created buying guides for the M1 Mac Mini, the M1 MacBook Air and the M1 MacBook Pro. I will leave links to all of them in the video description. I've also gone through the whole RAM debate in terms of whether or not you should go for eight gigabyte or 16 gigabyte. Again, and I'll leave a link to that video in the description. But today I'm going to cover something else which is really confusing people, understandably, and that is how much storage should you add to your M1 Mac. So before I get into the specifics, it's important to note that this advice covers all M1 Macs. They all have the exact same storage options. They all start at 256 gigabytes and go right up to two terabytes. Now two terabytes is loads of space. Unless you're storing lots and lots of video and lots of big files on your device, two terabytes is enough for most people. Trust me, it's, it's overkill, to be honest. 256 gig is the base. I don't think it's that bad, to be honest. I have an M1 MacBook Air and that has the 256 gigabyte base level SSD. And I'll be honest, it's absolutely fine because I don't store stuff on that laptop. I just use it to do email, to write, and just do general web stuff. So I don't store physical big files on that disk. And these days apps don't take up much room anyway. So first off, if that is your use case, just get the 256. The other thing to bear in mind is that Apple don't let you upgrade the storage further down the line. So you can't pop off the back of the Mac and put in a new SSD. You're stuck with whatever you choose from the start. And that makes this decision really important. You know, you've got to get it right first off. The only good thing really compared to the RAM, for example, because you can't upgrade the RAM either, is that with storage, you can add storage via third-party external storage devices, which I'll come on to in a moment. So it's not the end of the world if you get the, the choice wrong, but it, it makes sense to, to pick the right storage to begin with. Now for budgeting reasons, just a very quick note on the pricing that Apple has. If you go for the 512 gigabyte option, it's an extra $200. If you go for the one terabyte option, it's an extra $400. And if you go for the two terabyte option, it's an extra $800. And you can convert that into pounds if you're in the UK. So Apple's pricing is by no means the cheapest. It's very expensive actually, it always has been, but it is the most convenient way just to get a all-in-one package and you'll struggle to get the same kind of storage transfer speeds that you get from built-in SSD storage on the Mac. But there is another option. So the other option is to use external storage and use an external SSD drive, a bit like this. Now the upsides of that is that it's far cheaper than the Apple prices, and it's also infinitely expandable. You can just keep adding them. You know, if you, if you completely max out one of your external SSD drives, you can just get another one. The downside is you've got to carry these things around if you go for the M1 MacBook Air and MacBook Pro and you happen to be a mobile computer user. The other downside is speed. And, and as I mentioned a moment ago, if you want the absolute fastest storage speed possible, you pretty much have to go with what Apple gives you internally. Now you can get very fast external SSDs and I use one of those, which I'll explain a bit later, but even that is, it's still slightly below the speeds that you get with the Apple integrated SSDs. Now in terms of the pricing, I'm basing these prices, these are very rough prices to be honest, because they change all the time, but I am basing them on SanDisk prices, mainly because SanDisk is my preferred external SSD of choice. I think they're fantastic, but there are loads of options. So you, you do need to shop around. This is just purely a guide and just a point of reference. For instance, if you went for an external 250 gig SanDisk drive, you'd be looking at about $100 and that would bring you up to 500 gig in total if you start with the base level 256 gig of storage on the Mac. If you add 500 gig, that's about $140, $150, and that would give you 750 gig in total. If you go for a one terabyte external drive and add that to your 256 gig, Mac, you'd pay about $170, $180. That'd give you 1.3 terabytes in total. And if you opted for a two terabyte external SanDisk drive, you'd pay about $300-ish, and that would give you just over two terabytes in total. So again, those prices are completely rough. I've thrown loads of numbers at you there, but you can probably tell that those numbers are a lot lower than what you pay Apple. And like I mentioned before, you just you can keep adding SSD drives. You know, the, the external ones, you can keep plugging them in. You can have several of them if you want to. You can have one for backup. You can have one for your working files. And it's a lot cheaper than Apple. So if budget's a big concern, 
concern for you, which I completely understand, then it might be better just to go for the external SSDs. Now, speed-wise, all of those quoted prices are for drives which are about half the speed of what you get inside an, an SSD in a Mac. But they're still pretty quick. I, I think unless you're doing video editing or audio editing or something which requires lots of constant backwards and forwards transferring, and there's ways around that. You can use proxy files and stuff. Personally, I edit my videos from a SanDisk Extreme Pro. Now that is much closer to the SSD speed that you get within the M1 Mac. It's still not quite as fast, but it's not far off. I never really notice an issue with it. I, I love editing off that sand disk. It's the fact that I can take it between Macs is great. And like I say, it, it just seems quick enough for me. It's a bit more expensive. I think it's about $250 for the Extreme Pro version. But again, if you're a creator and you do this kind of thing, or if you're a photographer or something, it might be worth just spending a bit extra. Because actually in the long run, you end up spending less than you would on that Apple anyway. If you have an M1 Mac Mini, I think these external drives make total sense because you can just hide them behind a desk and they'll cost you less than Apple's upgrades. If you're a mobile user, like I say, it comes completely down to whether or not you want to carry these kind of things around. And also if you even need to store files. If you don't, if you're a cloud user, which I'll come on to in a moment, uh, I wouldn't worry, I'd, I'd stick with whatever you can afford SSD wise. I wouldn't spend more than you need to. Cloud storage, now I am a Dropbox user, but you, if you're a Mac user, you have, you have several choices, but I think the two main ones really are iCloud and Dropbox. The 50 gig iCloud storage is 99 cents a month, which over three years is about $36. 200 gig is $2.99 a month over three years. 107, $108-ish, and two terabytes is $9.99 a month, and over three years, that's about $360. Again, you can convert that roughly to pounds. Dropbox, you can get a free Dropbox account, which has a two terabyte limit, which isn't much, to be honest, but it's free. They've either got two gig or two terabytes. There's nothing in between at the moment. So if you want to go to the two terabyte option, it's actually the same as Apple. It's $9.99 a month. In terms of which one you go for, it's entirely up to you, really. They they both work brilliantly on Macs. Both Dropbox and iCloud work across multiple devices. You can use them on your phone. You can use them on your iPad. And they're built right into the OS. So they just appear as folders on your Mac. Now, I gave you the kind of three-year cost of those because it's important to bear that in mind. I think you've got to build that into the overall cost of the machine. The benefit of cloud storage is the fact that, again, it's expandable, but also you pay for it monthly. So you're spreading out that cost. It can't be used for intensive, you know, data intensive tasks. You know, I wouldn't edit video, for example, from Dropbox and the cloud. I'd have to have it locally. But if you're just using storage to put big files that you need to refer to occasionally, or you want somewhere to put your photos as a backup, or if you're running a business and you have lots of different Word documents and things, you want somewhere to put it securely, then iCloud and Dropbox might be a slightly more cost-effective way of doing that, and actually a more secure way of doing that than storing them, for example, on your M1 MacBook, because someone could just walk off with that MacBook, and that's not ideal. Just bear in mind that if you do go with the iCloud or Dropbox option, that it's important to be fairly specific with what exactly it stores locally on the computer. So on both services, you can tell it which files to store on the Mac and which ones to keep in the cloud. And if you do that, you can just basically keep the big stuff off your device, access it when you need to, and only leave the files on the machine that you need. So why would anyone pay Apple's upgrade prices for storage? I think it comes down to four things, really. I think the first one is you have the budget for it, which is fine. If you've got the money to upgrade to two terabytes in your M1 Mac, Go for it. Secondly, if you undertake lots of intensive work with big files and you don't want to carry around external drives, then it makes sense to pay a bit more and have everything on that one machine. The third, which I've mentioned before, is if you're a mobile user and you just don't want to be lugging around SSDs. They're not very big, but it's it's a it can be a hassle to keep carrying these things around. If you just want to carry a slipcase around with your MacBook Pro in, for example, in that case, it probably makes sense to max out the storage as far as you can. And the fourth reason is you might have a large collection of, for example, music or photos, and you might just be that sort of person who wants them on your laptop or on your Mac. You don't want to have to worry about them being on, on an external drive that you could lose or someone could steal. Then again, I'd spend as much as you can so you can have those files on the device. I mean, when it comes to music, that's quite a good example where some people want that instant access to their files. They don't want to worry about having to rely on an internet connection to get them from iCloud or from a streaming service. So that's another reason why paying a bit more and getting as much internal storage as you can would make sense. Quick note on SSD drive where I have done a video that features a bit of analysis on this, which I'll link to above. But 
Very quickly, there's been some concern raised over these eight gigabyte base level M1 Max. And the worry is that because they don't have a huge amount of RAM, they're having to rely more on the SSD to act as fake memory. And what that's doing is it's using the SSD more and SSDs have a limited lifespan and that lifespan reduces the more they're used. And there have been some people who've run benchmarks and basically they've seen that their SSD wear has kind of increased exponentially over a very short period of time in these eight gigabyte machines. Now I ran some tests, again, watch the video that I linked to a moment ago, my M1 Mac mini and my M1 MacBook Air haven't shown any signs of wear. So I'm not too worried. And I think if you look at these benchmarks that people have been running, they have really been hammering their machines. Now there was one where 3% of the drive had been worn away. And, but if you looked at the, the amount of data transferring that had been going on, it was huge. Most normal users, certainly the people that will go for the eight gigabyte version, won't be hammering their machine quite as much as that. So if you're reading about this SSD drive wear, I genuinely wouldn't worry too much. I'm gonna keep an eye on mine. Like I say, I have a base level eight gig M1 MacBook Air. If that starts to show issues, if I keep running that um, drive test app, then I will let you know about it. But my genuine advice on this is not to worry about it. Now my strategy I think is very quickly worth mentioning because I have two different ways that I use M1 Max, and I think they're quite common for two different sets of users. So the first one is my M1 MacBook Air. Now that is purely a writing device. I don't store anything on that machine locally. I use Dropbox for files that I need occasionally, but I only sync the files that I absolutely need. Everything else is kept on on Dropbox. And the apps I use, they're all pretty lightweight. They don't take up a huge amount of space. So for me, the 256 gig version totally made sense. And that might be your use case as well. If you're that kind of user, just go for the base level. My other M1 machine is an M1 Mac Mini, and that is my daily driver. That does all my production work, it does all the video editing, audio editing, all that kind of stuff. Now with that one, I went for the 512 gig storage. And the reason for that was that I knew I needed a bit of a buffer just in case I was transferring larger files occasionally onto the, the M1 Mac. But as I mentioned earlier, what I'm using mainly for my bigger file work is a external SanDisk Extreme Pro SSD, and that's a one terabyte version. And for me, that works brilliantly, because what I do, I transfer all of the footage that you're watching now onto that SanDisk, do the work on it on the M1 Mac Mini, upload to YouTube. Once that's all done, the original files get transferred to a four terabyte backup disk, which is connected to the iMac behind me, done. I really hope that has helped you pick the right storage for your Mac. However, if you're still stuck, ask a question in the comments. You'll notice that in previous videos, I will answer as many questions as I can, and also other people get involved as well. So if you're still stuck, I totally understand why. Get involved in the comments, and I'll do my best to help you out on there. But if you're now thinking, okay, storage sorted, but what about this eight gigabyte versus 16 gigabytes of RAM? Keep watching for a link to a video that I've done comparing the two to get an idea of which one you should go for. But in the meantime, thank you as always for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.